Hello, good afternoon. Um, so we're in the workshop room. So we'll be doing some collaboration uh, this afternoon. Um, so firstly, I wanted to do some introductions. I'll go first. Uh, I'm Steve Watts, and I really identify as a lifelong learner. Um, some of the photos express some of my interests outside of my professional work. Um, and the one I'm most excited about recently is this one down here. I live on a farm in Australia, and amongst other animals, chickens and alpacas, we have sheep. Uh, and just before I left, we we're coming into springtime, and the sheep were expecting to have lambs, and I had one sheep that was huge, and was huge for days and days before I left, and I was very worried that something was wrong, and she should have had lambs by then, and I got advice. Um, at the local feed store, and on the morning that I left, I went out, and this huge sheep had had three lambs. I was so excited. Um, if you had asked me or my family or my friends 20 years ago, would Steve Watts be living on a farm, uh, tending to sheep, having lambs, everyone would have laughed. Um, it, actually, were any of you at the music jam night last night? Nobody, one person. Okay, so uh, I was a tryhard on the piano for a little while, and for a long time people knew me as Steve the musician. Um, and it's been a long time actually since I've been able to do that. It was heaps of fun. But since then, I've learned so many things in my life. Um, I now know how to drive a tractor um, and to build rural fencing um, and to take care of sheep. Uh, and one of the things I love doing with my family as well is traveling and sharing that joy of discovery, discovering new places and learning new things. Um, so part of what I want to do today is to celebrate lifelong learning. Um, it doesn't have to be formal education, as we heard this morning from the presenter from UNESCO. Um, there's informal as well, and it keeps us alive. So that's me. Uh, what about you? I would like to use Menti. Uh, today, so please point your smartphones at the QR code. This should bring up a Menti poll, uh, and I'm going to ask you some questions together. So I'm going to flick over, hopefully, to uh, how am I going to do this? I'm going to flick over to my Menti poll in a browser. So I'll have to close my presentation, I guess. we go. And right, so if you've missed the code, does anyone still need it? The little box is down there. Now it's bigger. Does anyone need more time? Yes. OK, I'm seeing phones still pointing. I don't want to leave you behind. OK. All right, so I'm going to ask you some questions to help you introduce yourself. Firstly. Um, what is your favorite fruit? Today I'm going to be talking about the Moodle Box project which runs on a piece of hardware. Does anyone know what the hardware is called? There's a big clue on screen. Raspberry Pi. All right, great, great to see these coming in. So we get to know each other a little bit, what fruit we like. Lots of love for mango. So we also have fruit on our farm. We grow cherries for the birds at the moment. They're the only ones that eat the cherries. Apples, awesome. I love these. OK, that was the warm-up activity, just to make sure you're using the polling and can use your phone. Welcome for those who've just walked in. We're using Mentimeter. If you can go to menti.com, and then you can put the code at the top of the screen, you can join in too. We're just getting to know each other. So the next question, I'm super interested to learn where we all work. Uh, and I may have missed a few categories, apologies. You can select more than one if more than one applies. But do you, do you identify as working in international development and or formal education, informal? Are you with an edtech company, corporate learning, or something else? We can get a feel for who we have in the room. Oh, we have a lot of service providers. A 
feel, I feel like we should have a stream at these international moots for international development people to meet each other because I don't know who you are. I think I might have met one down there. Um, so there's nine people in the room working in international development. That's exciting. Uh, for people who work in other, does anyone want to call out what sector you work in? You don't wish to be identified. That's okay. This is Europe. We, you know, we keep our data private. I understand. Um, so I'm going to take a huge risk as a workshop facilitator and actually ask you why you're here. Uh, and I'm willing to tailor the session, at least the emphasis, a little. So some of you might be here because you're interested in learning the basics about how we can service learners who have no internet and the basics of learning offline and Moodlebox. Some of you are here because you just are curious and want to try it out. Some of you um, uh, might have gone a bit further and actually want to get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. I'm going to tell you a lot of things that don't work today. Um, or some of you might be wanting to find others who use Moodlebox. All right, so everyone's got the hang of this going great. Couple more votes coming in. So, um, this is perfect for me. Well done, everybody. <laughs> because we will start at the beginning and we'll learn the basics of Moodle Box. Um, there, there will be an opportunity for at least seven of you to try hands on. That's fine. Um, and we will get to learning lessons of uh, success and failure with Moodle Box. Um, so, only three of you want to find out from others, okay. This is a workshop, you know, we're meant to learn from each other, but maybe we won't spend quite so much time on that. Okay, um, I'm going to come back to the PowerPoint deck. I've probably broken it by stopping presenting. So do I click present live again? This one? Uh, resume. Resume session. Very good, thank you. Okay, so for those of you who'd like to learn the basics of Moodlebox, I'm going to give you a quick intro. Yes. Um, then I'm going to talk about a project that uh, a couple of us in this room have been involved in in Kenya. Um, and I will show what we built and what we worked with in Kenya. And I'll talk a bit about some of the customizations that we made to the box to overcome some of the limitations. Um, and then we'll see how we're going for time, but we'll have an opportunity for small group discussion. And if we're still hungry for more content, there's another project in Cambodia that I can talk about. But I'd like to think that you'll go away from this session with a basic understanding of the Moodlebox project uh, and the potential of offline learning, um, but also that you will have seen and potentially experienced uh, the way that works, and we'll have an opportunity to learn from each other and consolidate those learnings. So when you leave the room today, hopefully you will be informed. And if you are going to run projects using the Moodlebox um, code on Raspberry Pi, then you can learn some lessons uh, that we've learned over the last two years uh, the hard way, and maybe you won't make the same mistakes, and you'll be even more successful in the spirit of open source. Um, so I want to start off with a question. Why? Why do we need to think about supporting offline? And if there's nine of you in the room that come from a development background, you will already have a sense. Um, this is a three minute video that introduces the work that we do at Inclusive Education and really sets the scene for context where we might need to support learning in what we like to call low tech or low resource settings. There's no reason now why every child in the world can't have access to the world's knowledge. We want to empower thousands of teachers to reach millions of children. We believe every child has the right to learn anywhere. But right now, 450 million children are not learning. 
put technology in places that's going to mean that a child can learn. So education technology is fundamentally about bridging the gaps. It's about saying no matter where you live, no matter what socioeconomic status you have, no matter what cultural background you have, no matter what disabilities you may have been born with, then you should still have access to equal uh, education opportunities to anyone else in the world. And the only way to do that is through educational technology. When we think about the right to education, it means the child has a right to a school, a teacher, but there are so many things that can get in the way of that. From COVID, climate events and conflict, to cultural and religious beliefs, economic pressure on families and enormous class sizes. There are many factors that can stand in the way of access to quality education, but we know technology can help with so many of these. One of the things that inclusive education does is develop technologies that bridge that digital divide. For kids that don't have electricity or can't get to a smartphone or a computer, we're finding different ways to bring teachers to them. I think the craziest thing we're doing is trying to deliver online learning in an offline environment. Currently, we are deploying a learning management system into schools in Cambodia where there's no internet. I think often education is technology is misunderstood because actually education has always used technology. Whether that's a piece of chalk and a duster, or it's an overhead projector, or it's a, an online service, technology is actually a really important part of the education process. The crucial thing now though is that we now have global technologies and we have things that can work immediately across huge distances. Tech can bring a teacher to a child. For a child in a school that doesn't have a library, tech is access to books. Tech can connect children with other children and a learning community where otherwise that would be impossible. Tech is a way to move outside our buildings to where people need us. My experience is it can just take one teacher to change the life of a child. And I want us to be the organisation that helps that one teacher. So that, that's the work that we're passionate about. And in particular, we get excited about capacity building, helping people learn to use these tools effectively and about digital inclusion, um, which in our space is really challenging. I'm gonna keep clicking this, hopefully it goes. Um, it's really challenging because um, we found, and perhaps you have too, that when you're designing a project in international development, um, that inclusion is you know, near the top of the list if we're starting to think about um, use of technology. And so you may have a context where 80% of your learners or trainers or teachers or beneficiaries have access to internet, but 20% don't. Uh, and you're probably gonna get told by a program designer, well then, no internet, because the 20% will miss out and that's not fair. Um, so I would like to think that for those 80% access to, to the internet, it is pretty much a, you know, it's a digital right these days. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't artificially create a digital divide in our programming. On the other hand, we need to figure out how we can be inclusive from a digital point of view, digitally inclusive. So we want to provide a bigger diversity of technologies. In, in the video talked about a blackboard being a technology, an overhead projector is a technology, a book is a technology, and Moodle is a technology. These are all learning technologies. We want to make sure that people have access to education uh, in the best way possible, uh, regardless of their setting. So, if you haven't seen it, uh, this is a screenshot from the Moodle Box website. So it's moodlebox.net. Um, the URL is down the bottom. This is an open source project. Is anyone involved in this project? I should check. Awesome. Um, being open source, uh, there's, there's a sponsor, uh, but there are contributors and anybody can download this code and have a go at running it yourself, which is what we did. And so part of the workshop today is talking about our experience of working with the Moodlebox uh, code. It runs on 
a Raspberry Pi device, and I actually have one sitting on the stage for those that can see uh, down there. It's plugged in and we'll be using it in a moment, but uh, if you're curious and you go to your Wi-Fi network, you may see a Wi-Fi network called ILP Box. It stands for the Inclusive Learning Platform Box. So it's broadcasting a local, mm, help me out here, wireless access. Thank you, local area network right now. Um, and there's nothing being broadcast other than what's on the box. Well, there's nothing that can be accessed other than what's on the box. Um, so the, the purpose really of, of this project um, is to make Moodle work offline on a device which is small and mobile and will offer its own Wi-Fi access point. So that solves the problem for learners that may not have access to internet, but we want to provide opportunities for them to use e-learning. Um, there's some other problems, though, uh, that we may have present in our projects, for example, electricity or a digital device. And I'll come to that in a moment. OK. Um, so what we've built, we've, we call the inclusive Moodle box. Um, and a lot of times we've seen this used to support continuity of education or training. And as you saw in the video, there are lots of reasons why our programming gets disrupted. Um, we work in Tonga, and every year they have cyclone season, and pretty much every year cyclones will destroy or disrupt, damage some of their schools, and they have to shut down. It's a predictable um, disruption to their education continuity. Uh, there are other contexts uh, that might be related to uh, conflict, um, uh, migration, uh, pandemics, <laughs> let's not mention that. Uh, there are a number of reasons why our programming or formal education programming might be disrupted. And so one of the things we've been thinking about, I think, as a community is how can we make our e-learning and our education more resilient to those kind of disruptions? So the idea of the ILP box is to provide another option, another way that we can reach learners and make our e-learning available for them. So let's talk about Kenya. Um, we were really fortunate to be able to collaborate with Save the Children, who are an INGO. I think they're the world's largest child-facing INGO, uh, and they're a shareholder in our social enterprise, Inclusive Education. And we teamed with Sesame Street, um, who a brilliant organisation, and together uh, with a partner in uh, Kenya called EduTab, and Maxwell is here today from EduTab somewhere at the back of the room. Um, we designed a project called Watch, Play, Learn, uh, designed to bring opportunities for um, some basic education into the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. Um, so uh, just, just quickly, so the project uh, was running from mid last year to mid this year. It's just wrapped up. Um, the implementing partner was Save the Children. And what we wanted to do was strengthen classroom learning um, during free choice, maths, and creative activities. So we wanted to reach 320 early childhood development learners um, and, and work with a whole bunch of facilitators as well. And so we ran two classrooms and two schools each um, to estimated uh, reach of 80 students per classroom. Uh, you might ask 80 students per classroom. If you haven't worked in international development, yes, that's not uncommon. Um, so uh, this is Patrick from the EduTab team uh, setting up for, uh, for training sessions. Um, and what we did was we, we started out with train the trainer activities. So we had two courses, and I can show you a quick look in a minute. Um, one was basic digital literacy on how to use the tablets, digital tablets. And that's often a starting point in my experience for our projects. And then secondly, an introduction to the, to the content, but also the concept of playful learning. Um, so this is something that would have been negotiated with our instructional designers, and some of you would recognize that uh, playful learning is not commonly the kind of education that's practiced. Uh, there's a lot of rote learning. Sometimes there's singing. Um, but this was a different kind of concept that, uh, that the team had, had come up with that they wanted to introduce. So there were some specific things that were included in the design project to support digital inclusion. Um, 
One was the way that we thought about uh, the content. So rather than lots and lots of words, we're working with video and audio. So we're not assuming a level of literacy among the children here, uh, bearing in mind that some of this content was about emotional well-being and development. So the point was perhaps not necessarily to learn to read and write. It was recognising children in a vulnerable situation uh, and wanting to um, achieve some particular program objectives there. The second thing we did was recognise, OK, there's a lot of children in uh, a classroom um, and uh, these little boxes have limitations to how many can connect, like serious limitations. Um, and of course, no project can fund you know, unlimited resources. So the team came up with a model where they would share tablets, digital tablets, um, so children worked in groups. Uh, the third thing that we really focused on was capacity building of teachers and trainers. Um, and in that way, we have people working with the children who speak their language and understand them and, and know them, and I think are more likely uh, to provide positive learning experiences. And then finally, all of the video content from Sesame Street was revoiced, uh, voiced over. Okay, so that's some of the things that we designed. And then, obviously, and probably the thing I didn't put on the list, was we used the Moodle Box project to deliver all of this through an offline, uh, offline box. So for those of you who are interested in more of the technology uh, side of things, uh, so the box is a server. We made some changes to it because uh, we were aware that there were some limitations to uh, the Raspberry Pi boxes. Um, so we beefed up the storage significantly we're working with video, there was a lot of content to fit on this box. But, and by the way, you can imagine how expensive it would be for someone to consume all of that video over the internet. Um, uh, so this is also a great benefit of working offline. Uh, so the box broadcasts its own Wi-Fi network, so you, most of you, I'll be interested to know how many actually, should be able to see it uh, from, the, from the box. Um, and uh, learners access the content through a tablet running the Moodle mobile app. Uh, so we just use Moodle. Um, and the, the videos um, were developed in a range of formats, and there's some PDFs and some, and some games. Um, but one of the great things about the Moodle app is it is fairly resilient to internet dropouts. In fact, there's a lot of content on the app that will work without internet. So if you can imagine this, uh, a child or a teacher might bring the tablet close to the ILP box and sync, but then go away with the tablet, because now it's on there, and the Moodle app will remember, you know, cache the, the course, and then other people can come to the box, you know, almost like coming to the well to get water or, or, or something like that, digital well. Um, so that's the way that the project used the box as a, as a broadcast resource but we didn't intend for everybody to be connected to it all the time. Uh, it's a really fantastic approach, uh, and if you haven't considered that in your projects, worth, worth testing and trialling, because the, the Moodle mobile app is uh, a brilliant bit of kit. Okay, now the bit that I have heart palpitations uh, about, and you all enjoy, the live demo. <laughs> so, um, we're going to... Is that okay? You do it. <laughs> I don't want to break your setup. Okay, and um, hmm. how are we going to do this? Thank you. Is everyone feeling confident? shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. So if you want to follow along, you can, uh, but I'll get specific now. I will warn you that uh, this little Raspberry Pi box can only support a certain number of concurrent users, and it does kind of depend on what you're doing to it, how much traffic you're trying to put through it. 
But if you would like to try following along, and you can see the network uh, ILP box one, go ahead and try and connect to it. Maxwell, am I making a terrible mistake here? Do you think we can connect a bunch of people? Okay. Not more than five or six. Yeah. And, and it does depend what we're, what we're doing. So if you would just like to connect to the box to see it, well, that will be interesting. Maybe we can crash it and we will have learned something as a, as a group. But these things do have uh, limit, limitations. And it's one of the reasons why we made, uh, made a change to the, to, the, um, to the hardware that we're working with. OK. So will you, uh, yes, so you will want a password. That's right. Um, so the password is capital I, capital L, capital P, ILP, Inclusive Learning Platform. Little letters, B O X, box, zero, zero, one. And it does take a little while to resolve the network connection. How many people have got in the room? More than 10. Um, what I'm not going to tell you is the login for the Moodle site, so I'm hoping, Maxwell, that that will allow the server to perform OK. Uh, but you can, by all means, hit the, the home page. Uh, can we have a few hands up if that password worked for you? Yes? Worked for at least one person. Uh, and it's interesting. So the Wi-Fi network's reaching right around the back. Work for Mike. Is that Mike? I'm wearing my computer glasses. All right, uh, and the URL you want to hit is http colon slash slash moodlebox.home. Home. And in terms of internet, uh, the whole galaxy of the internet on this box is restricted to that one URL uh, and the Moodle site. Yes, I think you have to do the http colon slash slash though, moodlebox.home. And it may take a little while to resolve. Yeah. Too many. Who has connected? One, two, three, four, maybe. Five. Yeah, so there you go. And, and you've got a 404. Six. OK, stop. Seven. Oh my goodness, it's going to blow up. Um, OK, so, so the good thing is the antenna that we installed is working well if it's um, hitting down the back, so that's a win. Um, so you can imagine from an instructional design point of view, we're already starting to think, OK, if we have 80 children or we have 40 teachers or we have four classrooms, how are we going to manage access here? Um, so very quickly we get to thinking about um, groups and staging um, so that there's a successful experience. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to log in. Um, and perhaps when I'm done showing you around, I'll, uh, I, I'll invite a couple of you to, to have a go as well. Nope, thanks. Okay. Um, so from a design point of view, you'll notice that we kept it real simple. And there's lots of visuals in this Moodle course. In fact, it doesn't look a heck of a lot like Moodle. Uh, but in here, uh, we've got the uh, teacher training uh, courses that we used uh, with the Train the Trainer. So now we're looking at a pretty typical looking, uh, looking course. Um, so the kind of topics you'll see here, you know, intro to using a tablet, to using tablets for digital learning, collaborative learning with tablets, you know, the real nuts and bolts. Um, and what we've learned is on the ground, face-to-face -face support in, in the way that Edutab provided is an essential ingredient. Um, don't attempt to do this stuff remotely. Make sure that you either have project resources on the ground or a, an implementation partner um, that can represent you in a culturally appropriate, language appropriate way makes all the difference in the world. Um, most of you won't know me, some of you might. I used to work for a Moodle partner called NetSpot in Australia years ago. Um, I've been working with Moodle for a long time and I can remember in the university sector, 
working with grumpy lecturers. I presume they're still grumpy for those of you that work in industry. Um, you usually had sort of one or two minutes of patience with them to try something new with technology before they go, oh, this just doesn't work, I give up. And, uh, and then, it was, you know, then you have to convince them to come back. So that immediate face-to-face -face support is crucial. Okay. Um, so there's no need really for me to walk you through the courses other than to say we used the Moodle box for teacher training um, and there's course content there. Sli slightly more interestingly, um, if we go to the social, social and emotional learning videos, uh, bad news, Cookie Monster is frustrated. Oh, and you don't have audio, but that's okay because... I don't know where that sound came from, but I could hear it. It's coming from there. So, um, I can actually spot an issue here. I don't know if you've spotted it. That's definitely not English. Uh, let's try it in Somali. Okay, you get the idea. So um, we, uh, there are heaps of videos um, that are voiced and loaded up. Uh, and the box did a pretty good job at streaming them out. But we found the best practice first was to sync your course with the Moodle mobile app on a tablet and take it away so that you're not hitting the box. Uh, and that's a really viable approach for you to take. Um, okay, so far so good. There's a few, couple of people in the room who are here as my safety net to catch me if it all went horribly wrong. Uh, but so far seems to be going pretty much right. Um, would anyone like to have a go? Maybe we'll take a hands up and I can give you a username and password. We can have two or three people connect. Thank you. Yeah, so if you um, type in the username student2 and password student2, would anyone else like to have a go? And you might identify a theme here. Yes, okay, so if you use student3, student3, and student4, student4, and we'll stop there, uh, you should be able to log in and maybe just show other people on your, on your table. So again, just to confirm, you are not on the internet, you're on a closed box. While that's happening, um, would anyone like to suggest some uh, other reasons why development actors might like this approach when it comes to children's learning? Or is that too obvious a question? I don't think it is. So apart from dealing with digital inclusion and offline, uh, why else might this be appealing as a pedagogical approach? No one wants to talk? Okay, some of you are thinking but not saying, I'm certain. So in terms of child safeguarding, this is great because they're not on the open internet. Um, and uh, uh, I can remember a project four years ago that we ran with a telco who uh, was part of their deal. They wanted to see lots of data going over the internet. So we ran a live, uh, a live connection with apps and the uh, internet filtering was a nightmare. Um, we spent the whole project trying to blacklist or whitelist and, and uh, get it all sorted out. So working offline uh, can be a really you know, positive thing when it comes to programming use of digital with children. 4.35, okay. Everyone logged in okay? Yeah, cool, okay. All right, I'm gonna go back to the slides and then we'll have some discussion. Thank you. I did just put a screen protector on it before I left. So. Actually, would like this to break. I've had it about four years. All right, thank you. I wouldn't really like it to break. All right, so um, there was some 
coding that the team undertook for this project and another project uh, that dealt with another um, requirement for our project team, which was, okay, well done, the, the box is going to support learners who have no internet, the box is going to be offline, give us data from the box. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there's, there's commonly two or three ways that we solve this together. One way is you can, you can do a system where you go around with a memory stick and manually pull, pull data. We chose the approach where if you can bring the box into an internet network, even for a brief period of time, then we can pull data off. Um, so we wrote, there's meant to be an animation there. Why isn't it playing? Um, it's not playing in the browser. Imagine a, a really beautiful arrow that I spent like three minutes animating going up and another one going down. Um, so on the Raspberry Pi box, an administrator can push a button uh, uh, that activates a plugin that we wrote that will push content, yeah, the mouse is at least working, low high tech, um, up to a Moodle site on the cloud. Why do that? Because now we're pushing all the user data up onto the cloud, and now you can remote into the cloud from anywhere in the world and start to pull that data down, or even if you're really clever, start pulling it into a, a reporting visualization, or if you're really, really clever, start to integrate it with other meal reported data which is being captured from a project to share in near real time. Um, really powerful stuff. The other plugin that we've um, written is on the server side where we can do the reverse, so we can pull data from the box, but we can also push content down. Um, and I don't think I've been in a project yet where we've been brought in late, contracts been signed weeks after the project actually kicked off and everything needs to be done immediately, but then people change their mind. Uh, we've had boxes ship to the field and then we get the request, okay, we need to put some more content on the box. And we're like, they're over there <laughs> now. Um, so we wrote this tool that you can push content down. Um, and so this becomes really powerful. It's definitely a first generation. We found some limitations. It worked in some contexts. Then with boxes um, uh, that were configured or had lots of content on them, it stopped working. Uh, so I don't want to overpromise you know, that this is a, a ship-ready product. Um, but it certainly worked well in um, in contexts that were relatively uh, lightweight. So, uh, some reflections on this project. What worked well? Well, the offline piece definitely worked well. In a context where there wasn't internet for everybody, this worked. We were able to distribute video. Um, the capacity building with teachers worked really well. They developed digital competencies and were able to support uh, learners and, the, and they reported, uh, the learners reported that they found the tech easy to use. Um, and th there's evidence um, based on the number of times that videos had been opened and Moodle sites were hit. Little glitch though, uh, the tablets were being shared between learners and the team chose not to do a individual username password because of the, the likelihood that that just creates disruption. So we had this kind of bulk data for the project that we're able to report, but uh, not on an individual level, which was a source of frustration for the project team. So challenges and lessons that we learned. One was when you have 40 digital devices all playing a video from uh, Cookie Monster, uh, that's a lot of Cookie Monsters and it gets noisy. Um, so next time, uh, either deploy headphones as well, or what the team ended up doing was you know, more of a rotation, rotational use of the data. One of the boxes broke, technology breaks. Fortunately, we had the EduTab team on site and they were able to replace the box, but that happens, expect it. So I would design with some redundancy, I would suggest. Um, and there were really high expectations from the project team around the data that we would pull. Um, and in retrospect, um, you know, probably, um, no, I don't know how to put it other than we knew up front what the issues were and, and by, I think by the end of it, everybody else did too. Um, and we may have been able to do things differently um, next time. But, you know, data, data is really important when you're working in international development. So this is a piece that requires, I think, further attention and investment from a few of us. Um, so um, there's some of the lessons that we learned. And I guess the other thing, honestly, was that we were a little disappointed that 
although we beefed up a number of components in the Raspberry Pi devices, that practically really, you know, only you could comfortably say five to maybe 10 users at a time connect. We were kind of hoping for more like 30. And I've certainly seen devices um, with beefier components, then you get a trade-off. They need more power, um, they're more expensive. So I think as, a, as an industry, we're still yet to kind of find that sweet spot, you know, on price and power consumption. We, we used power banks to power the devices, um, which was a fairly sustainable uh, way to go. Okay, um, let's go back to Menti and uh, we'll do some more kind of workshop components here. Oh, that was another question I could have asked earlier. We'll skip that one. Um, so what I'd like to invite you to do at your tables, and if you're not at a table with other people, join one. Have a quick chat, what, what you think Moodlebox is great for from your perspective. Um, and then at least one of you, or two of you, scribe and enter into Menti, and, uh, and we can look at those results together. Um, so yeah, we've got a few minutes, so take two or three minutes to chat amongst yourselves at your table if you dare, or at least a partner, someone next to you, be friendly, we learn from each other, it's an open source community. And then at least one of you, scribe, if you've not yet got access to Menti, just go to menti.com and use the code at the top of the screen. I'll give you a couple of minutes. So this is great. Um, and I'm seeing some of the themes that I've touched on, like the need for local support included here. Um, we've talked about low cost, security, uh, which is good to acknowledge, I think. Um, and yeah, it is great for schools with no internet access. It's pretty exciting you know, to be in a community where the school may have no windows, might have a dirt floor, the only technology is a blackboard, but we can bring kind of sustainable technology and it's powered by the sun, for example, um, and we can bring in you know, a rich set of learning resources, particularly where there's no library. You know, it's just heartbreaking when you see context where there's just no books. We can bring all these rich resources, which is um, just wonderful. Okay. Uh, refugee camps, yes, that's a good context. No cable infrastructure. Isn't it, isn't it brilliant that Oftentimes in international development, we can just leapfrog a bunch of stuff that um, in, I guess, high income countries we relied on, like electricity lines for electricity or ethernet cables for internet. We don't need that stuff. Wonderful. Okay, next question. So uh, based on what you've heard today or in your own experience, what do you see as some of the limitations of Moodlebox? What have you learned not to expect from a Raspberry Pi device? Thank you for the responses. Yes, maintaining the hardware is an interesting one. I, I would suggest over order. Uh, Raspberry Pis during COVID, and I suspect still, were really hard to get a hold of. So order a few more than you need. You, you want to have one for your tech support team to have on, on hand, so they can uh, test and debug. You probably want to have a couple of spares in the field as well. You'll need, probably need one for teacher training. Um, so there's a range, range of reasons why you'd want to do that. So yeah, the no data on individual progress, you can, it's just people need to log in. So you'd need to solve uh, that problem for your project. Um, and just with the number of children that we were working with, the team decided not to issue every child a username and a password. We could have, and then we would have had that data. Um, I've seen some projects where actually what we're inter interested in is gender or by age. Uh, in which case you can have you know, tablets for boys or girls or you just have a simple thing where you select I'm a boy or a girl. Um, so some identifying information. So that is, that is possible, it's solvable, it's really down to the project design. Um, so you need to weigh up um, the digital you know, capability uh, that the people you're working with have to log in and log out. Yeah, so space, so in this case we really beefed up the hard drive. Maxwell, how big's the hard drive in this box? 500 gigabytes, that's huge. Yes, yeah, like a laptop. 
thank you. Um, yeah, so that's configurable. Um, <laughs> I can remember when I first started out, you know, we charge by the megabyte for, for hosting. Um, yeah, update of resources is li limited. Yeah, so out of the box, the Moodle box project uh, is one where you will put something on there and ship it. People can uh, build courses locally, but you wouldn't be able to remotely update that box without some enhancement or support like we, like we built. Um, and yes, the loading times can be slow. I was talking to someone earlier who said yes, but still slow is better than no internet. So we can, we can live with that. Um, but, uh, but it's a factor. I'm pushing buttons to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what ideas do you have? We've shared some of the things that we've done to make Moodlebox more functional. Um, what are your thoughts? And again, you might want to chat amongst other people that would make this approach, this offline learning approach, better. How could we improve this? What are your ideas? And just for amusement, I don't know why, but I decided to put an animation of an alpaca <laughs> reminding me of home. It actually looks more like a llama, and there is a difference. Really? Well, they look different in Australia, but yes. Yeah, and the llamas have the bigger, yeah, like this, yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell, it's an illustration. Yeah. No ideas yet. Um, maybe I need to give you some prompters. So uh, if we wanted to have more people connected to it, that's one problem to solve, how you might do that. Um, if you wanted to pull more data on an individual, how you might design for that. The issue is Mentimeter. It's not open. Thank you. Just mark the time. We're 51 minutes into the session and something finally has gone wrong. <laughs> That's not too bad. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, all I can really think to do is rerun it or check the settings. So, oh, no, I've never seen this before. I thought I'd pay for this, but maybe I don't. Maybe I've run out of free questions. <laughs> Well, this is good. We have to talk to each other now. Who has an idea of how this could be improved? Thank you. We have a microphone. Sorry, just a minute. I, I can't hear you, so perhaps others can't as well. We'll run a microphone out to you. improvement but just another use case scenario we mm -hmm. uh, as you said most of these settings don't have books and we looked at uh, we used one of the raspberry Pis way back and an earlier version of the Pi and converted it into a library server and hosted a whole bunch of 5,000 6,000 EPUB books using Libre uh, Calibre which is our open source library management software and hosted it at you know one place in the school uh, that school had digital devices so children could read um, any kind of book at any point of time or magazines or whatever it is that we hosted. So uh, that was one uh, use uh, and it, it worked brilliantly because books are not uh, you know, a huge budget burden and that was one. Another scenario I'd just like to present that what we've used, uh, these are in hybrid locations where there is some amount of internet. So we customized uh, Debian and branded it, uh, the organization's called Tamarind Tree, so we branded it as Treebian. Yeah. We, put, we put a suite of open source uh, uh, resources like JCompre, TuxMath, TuxPaint, yeah. Uh, J fractions, K geography from the KDE environment. And we installed this uh, in a substance abuse center. So they had uh, a set, so when, uh, you know, when they would log into the Raspberry Pi, they had a set of offline ready to use OERs. And they also had internet. So at particular times in the day, they could use the Moodle LMS. The people running the show were given uh, 
the micro SD card reader. So in case something goes wrong with the OS and you don't know what to do, you just take it out and you know throw it, you know send it back to us, and you just install it again. Um, so my a couple of uh, points is I think there are a lot of technological solutions. The main challenge is in, in the uptake of either an SBC in a rural setting or Moodle in a box is the mindset of the people running the show. Yeah. That's one. And second is the consistent use of the program. So if implementing partners like them withdraw, uh, then the teachers or the setup there stops using that set up. So there's a lot more cultural uh, you know, training and that kind of thing. Technological solutions have existed even 10 years ago. Uh, but the uptake and then the perseverance that if something doesn't work, what do we do? You know, how do we do that? If there is no motivated implementing partner or no yeah. motivated audience, um, that's one. The second thing we found is that if you are delivering directly to children through the SBC or through Moodle in a Box, the results are far higher than when you are putting a lot of effort training teachers. Right. Whereas if you have content, the child will say, I want to access that content tomorrow morning. I uh -huh. need to see that video again. I want to do that quiz again. Yeah. So working with the beneficiary directly over the intermediary, which is a teacher who is more hesitant, yes. very inhibited, uh, you know, doesn't want to make the effort, yeah. uh, has worked more successfully successfully than going top down. Yes. Uh, then children yeah. demand it and then the institution, you know, sort of has to provide it. And it becomes a resource. Yeah. So yeah. we're really happy to hear and I would like to share some of our experiences later on. But we've been doing yeah. a lot of work with Raspberry Pi. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks for your contribution. It's, and it's, I'm glad you spoke up. Um, because we are a community and one of the things I wanted to say is I, for those of you who have tried working with Raspberry Pis or you're working in the development sector, I'd love to meet you. Um, so that we can learn from each other or commiserate <laughs> when things go wrong. Um, I live and work out of Australia, which feels like a long way from here sometimes. And so these connections are particularly valuable uh, from my perspective. So, and there's a few familiar faces in the room that I've met already and I'm, I'm glad to have met you. Would anyone else like to share your thoughts about how uh, this approach could be improved? Or I'll open it up if there are questions about uh, what we've done. Um, if there's technical questions, we have technical people in the room. Um, and otherwise, uh, I might be able to help. Yeah, so glad to take questions or suggestions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, all right, question. Um, so the problem with Raspberry Pi is not if the SD card or whatever storage you put in there uh, going to break, but when. How do you uh, make a backup plan on, on when the, the, the SD card or the SSD is uh, uh, corrupted? Yes. Hey, Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So in in the I think if I understand the question is what happens if you're using the Pi and mid project something fails like the SD card or the drive. Um, so I guess the question is how do we how could we mitigate that risk? So we chose to write the code that would allow the course sync function. So we had a copy of that data online once it was synced. So we, it was like taking us back 20 years, right? Remember we used to back up servers and we used to do monthly backups and weekly backups and um, it, it, it's like that. You're just encoding that uh, in, in your project. So that's, that's one approach you can take. Um, so another thing we did was build, uh, build it so that we could clone um, the pies. So we could, we could clone a new pie and send it out. We wouldn't have the user data, but we would have all the course content information um, set up without the expense of having to have all those devices sitting on the shelf. Um, so that is an, another approach you can take. Oh, we've got two minutes. All right, last quick question. And when we can chat more afterwards. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to seek out Maxwell, who's, who has experience with SD cards and corrupting. And I think that's why we went with the solid state. Yep. Any other questions? 
Okay. Um, then I'm going to wrap up. I just wanted to let you know what else we're working on. So it's been really exciting and terrifying and humbling to have the opportunity to work on actually two projects. We've also worked in Cambodia, and I didn't talk about that project today, um, where we've been using uh, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, meanwhile, our team has been working on ways to make Moodle more digitally inclusive um, from a SAS point of view. Um, so we've written uh, a way to register with a mobile phone number, knowing that a lot of our projects uh, have users that don't have an email address. We're also supporting EPUB files so that the Moodle mobile, sorry, so that Moodle can be used uh, as an e-reader. So that's in the browser, and that opens up more possibilities. And we've integrated the Twilio text messaging system with Moodle forums. And so now we're giving some of our instructional designers, like Lauren, the challenge of, hey, how would you design for learners, some of whom have a smartphone and others might be in a community with a handphone and receive SMSs? Can you be more digitally inclusive um, that way? And finally, we're simplifying Moodle by basically turning stuff off, um, which we're excited about as well. Um, so thank you for participating and I look forward to meeting some of you after and, and this evening and, and hanging out. I hope it was a session that met the expectations that we set at the start to learn some basics about Moodle and see what worked and what, what didn't. Um, and hopefully you met someone interesting or you're about to in the session as well. Wish you a great conference and look forward to partying on tonight. Thanks everyone.